Okay, I'm going to present you a very short, comprehensive view of what has happened after the collapse of the very bad regime, which was called socialism or communism. <clears throat> this is comparative. I am not going to focus only on Poland. Poland will be included. But of course, I would welcome questions on Poland and other countries. And besides, uh, you've got uh, a short paper of, of mine. How was it in Poland? So you can refer to it too, you can read it. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, now, let me remind you what was socialist as a system, not as an ideology. Ideology promises a lot, but it's an institutional system. It has two features. The first one I mentioned, private ownership of assets, including enterprises, was prohibited. And this is why there was a monopoly, or quasi-monopoly, of the state ownership, <clears throat> which means total political power over the economy. <clears throat> and second, market transactions were prohibited. And since markets is a coordination device, another device was needed. And it was certain plan central planning. <clears throat> now, if you have these two features, two other features followed. This is a logic. First non-democracy. You can't have free elections, civil rights, while you have monopoly of the state and prohibition of transactions. It never happened. I think for the simple reason that uh, so far there was no society, the majority of which would vote for prohibition of private ownership and uh, free transactions. To be sure, you may have very bad policies under some democracies, <laughs> but not that bad. <laughs> and if you have very bad policies under democracy, then some rulers prohibit democracy, like in Venezuela. And finally, not only democracy in the sense of political free rights were prohibited, but also other civil rights, like freedom of the media, freedom of association, etc. And because otherwise socialism was not being maintained. But to enforce these prohibitions a certain institutions was crucial. It was very representative of the socialist regime. And the name of this institution in Russia was KGB. And in, some other, in all other countries, there were similar institutions in Poland, security services in Romania, Securitatis. No KGB, no socialism. Very short, in a nutshell. This is the shortest definition. Now, uh, coming back to economic characterization, this is an overall diagram which tries to link institutional system, policies, and political economy. Now, starting with the domestic institutional system like in Israel or some other countries, it's useful, I found it useful to distinguish two kinds of institutions which to some extent overlap. The first one I call propelling institutions and they are responsible for the long-term economic growth. They may be weak or strong. The most important institutions of this sort, empirically speaking, uh, is private ownership and competition. And there, is no, there are no good substitutes for these institutions. The second kind are constraining constraining the rulers. Now, you may change the institutions and these are policies through reforms. And uh, on the other hand, constraining institutions create a scope for macroeconomic and other policies. And if there are no constraints or weak constraints, there is much more risk that the rulers would engage in catastrophic policies. <clears throat> And as I mentioned before, it is not in the market system when you have most catastrophic policies, not under capitalism, but under non-market system, because the rulers are not constrained, institutionally constrained. Now you can link these to longer term economic growth. So propelling institutions determine the systematic growth <coughs> over the longer run. And here the most important force, as all we know, is innovations. 
In a backward country, initially most innovations come from the technology transfer. It is only natural. It should not be surprising. But for the innovations, including technology transfer, to be present, you need a special system. Not, poverty is not enough to stop being poor. You get out of poverty only under some systems. Now, uh, how strong or weak are constraining institutions determines how many policy-induced shocks you have to your economy. And the most painful shocks happen under non-market systems. You know, even though many, most people think it is capitalism under which we have the crisis. Yes, but the worst crises are elsewhere, and even those crises which happen under capitalism are not necessarily caused by capitalism. People confuse. You know, sneezing is in your nose, but is the nose the cause, the reason for the sneezing? To put it very simple, <laughs> of course not. <laughs> now, policies in turn are determined by policy, uh, by political economy factors like personality matter, political circumstances matter. There are certain times, which I call times of extraordinary politics, when it is easier than normal to push market reforms. It is either liberation like in Poland 89 or crisis, somewhere else. And you have this interplay of these factors. Now, I'm going further. Why socialists, or what I'm doing here? No, okay. From economic point of view, socialism was a huge failure because these const uh, the constraining institutions were very weak. Who was constraining Stalin? Who was constraining, or what was constraining Mao Zedong? <laughs> so they could have engaged, and they did, in catastrophic policies. There were some milder cases, uh, debt crisis, irresponsible policies, not only criminal policies, but irresponsible policies are likely where rulers are not constrained. But also propelling institutions were very weak because of the absence of competition and private ownership. And the weakest, the greatest weakness of socialists was it, is, it was anti-innovative. There were no innovations, no major innovation in the civilian sphere. In the military sphere, yes, but not in the civilian. There is a joke. It is only half joke. The question is, what was the greatest civilian invention under socialism? The response is the Rubik's Cube. <laughs> it's very ingenious. <laughs> okay, no, so this was a very bad system. And uh, let me show what were the economic costs. And your economic costs are lost opportunities, opportunity costs. These are only illustrations, which are, however, Ill representative for the whole story. <clears throat> if you compare Poland and Spain, you see that in 1950, Poland has the same per capita income as in Spain. And in 1990, we had only 42% of Spain per capita income. The same story, it's true when you compare Hungary and Austria, or former Czechoslovakia and Austria. Now, the most extreme difference has appeared in North and South Korea, the same culture, but completely different system. North Korea, as you know, is like one concentration camp, extreme Stalinist regime. And South Korea, since the early 60s, has a pro-export, private ownership uh, system. And after how many years? 50 years, you have a huge gap. South, North Korea had on, has only 67% of South Korean income, and millions of people have died in North Korea. So this is the price of the very bad system, and this shows you the power of institutions, meaning large differences in institutions, if they persist, produce huge differences in the standard of living. <clears throat>
Now, for some of you who still believe that Cuba is a paradise, <laughs> there is a <laughs> comparison of Cuba with uh, the economically most successful country so far in Latin America, which is Chile. And you shall see also a huge difference. By the way, in Latin America, usually they are not socialist, but very intervention, interventionistic system, status. And this explains why economic performance of Latin, in most Latin American countries is so poor. Finally, China. You have two stages in Chinese history. The first one is under Maoism. And then China was growing very slowly, slowly than Western Europe. So China was lagging. And 50 million, million people died because of catastrophic policies of Mao Zedong. Since the late 70s, we have a shift from socialism away to something resembling capitalism, or a tremendous opening of the economy. Chinese exports are five times as large as that of India. China has accumulated five times as much foreign direct investment than India. And uh, there has been a growing share on non-private, non-public enterprises. To be sure, Chinese, China is not an ideal system, but it is a much better system than it used to be. So you have to, to, from the point of view of civil rights, it's still a repressive system. From the point of view of economic freedom, there has been a huge improvement. And as a result of that, several million poor people have been brought out of poverty, not by a special regional policies, no, <laughs> but by economic, sort of economic uh, opening. And last year, uh, China has uh, surpassed the United States as a number of foreign tourists is concerned. <laughs> 100 million Chinese, you should attract more Chinese. And this is, as long as uh, economic reforms are not reversed and continue, there will be more. Of course, I can discuss China a little more later. Let me see that there are, there are growing problems in China, too. One of them is a arti artificially fast growth of the financial sector. Huge ratio of financial asset to GDP. More than 200%. Which is typical of very developed countries. In Poland, it's 60%. So in Poland, uh, the growth of financial sector was organic in China, so they have. And as you probably know, the labor supply in China is going to decline. So they have to rely much more on productivity growth. And they cannot stimulate and stimulate by monetary or fiscal stimulus these problems. They cannot solve these problems. The same goes, of course, for most of European countries, I think. Now, how there's a whole story how socialism was dissolved. It is an extraordinary story. I can only say this has been to everybody who believed in individual rights the most positive developments after the Second World War. Absolutely, by far. Globally speaking, and it was a surprise for most people, including those of the crucial actors. For example, Gorbachev did not plan to dissolve Soviet Union, but he contributed to that. <laughs> so to, to cut this story very short, you have two parallel developments since the, in the second half of the 80s, the later half since 87. In Central and Eastern Europe, you have some growing opposition and economic problems. In some countries, especially Poland. And uh, uh, communist authorities, which introduced a martial law in December 89, were incapable of solving problems because I think they were very much afraid of the population. To solve the problems required some harsh reforms. <clears throat> so without much intending, they concluded an agreement, which led to the first non-communist government in Poland, and in this government, uh, which I was a member of, introduced radical reforms. 
I leave it aside. Uh, so Poland was the first country to have non-communist government already early, November, early September 89 and to launch policies which were aiming at changing the system. Both we became democracy and we are aiming at capitalistic, if you will, or market economy. <clears throat> and then some other countries followed. Very briefly, former Czechoslovakia, similar, there was a Velvet Revolution agreements, etc. Then you have Hungary. There's a special story about East and West Germany. Everybody remembers the fall of Berlin Wall. But the fall of Berlin Wall happened later than the change in Poland. And the day before the Berlin Wall has fallen, the then Chancellor Kohl came to Poland on a very important state visit. He was hugely surprised that Berlin Wall started to fall next day. <laughs> you see the surprising element in history. He interrupted his visit went to the Berlin Wall, make a speech, and return to Poland. <laughs> make some irresponsible prom economic promises at the Berlin Wall, and return, and continued his talks in Warsaw. The only blood kind of a bloody change was in Romania, where the dictators, Ceausescu, couple were killed. But this was not a massive. Everything was peaceful. Now, parallel to that, in the Soviet Union, still existing, there were some movements initiated by Gorbachev without, however, him intending to have a radical change. He introduced what was called Pierestroika. He wanted the socialist to be more efficient. He believed in socialism. <laughs> so, and there were some catastrophic measures. For example, he prohibited the production of alcohol. Can you imagine to prohibit or limit the production of consumption of alcohol in Russia <laughs> and Ukraine? <laughs> so there were house measures. And I told you another story. I was in the 90s, I was on a visit to Kazakhstan, invited by then president. And they served me something in teacups. But in these teacups, there was no tea but vodka. And I asked them, why are you serving vodka in teacups? Um, they said, this is because of Gorbachev times. <laughs> but this was long after Gorbachev was gone. <laughs> so the habit has survived Gorbachev. So then he, once his uh, attempt to strengthen socialism failed, as it was bound to fail, he went for what was called guasnos, or openness. And he allowed uh, more freedom of speech, more freedom of association. He also relaxed the restrictions on private ownership. But they, they did not call private ownership by its name. They call it cooperatives. Because private ownership is anathema. But these cooperatives de facto were private ownerships. So they launched economic liberalization to some extent, but they preserved the central planning and huge state ownership, as a result, they created huge possibilities for easy gain. You could buy at the control prices and sell at free market prices or export. And some enterprises directors from, as you can imagine, some private enterprises. So it was under Gorbachev times, and not later, that the first oligarchs have appeared. But it was later rulers like Yeltsin who were blamed for oligarchs, not. For example, Khodorkovsky. You might remember Khodorkovsky, yes? One of the oligarchs, very talented. By the way, most of the oligarchs in Russia and also in Ukraine were not the former apparatchiks. Former apparatchiks were not clever enough. Who was the most oligarch? They were mathematicians, like Berezovsky, or physicists, or chemists, like Khodorkovsky. They were, you, some of them belong to Komsomol, which is youth organization, but I don't know of any oligarch who was part of secretary. Some of them were KGB, because they had a lot of insider information. So mathematician and KGB, they were oligarchs. But it created, it created a sort of a negative reaction 
against suddenly rich people, which was blamed on the later rulers. What has contributed to the downfall of the Soviet Union? And this is a very instructive story. Very low prices of oil and gas have fallen very sharply. And the uh, Soviet Union faced bankruptcy. And they are very susceptible to Western pressure. And so happened that it was uh, Reagan, who was a tough guy. <laughs> so he could talk to Gorbachev. <laughs> So uh, this is another surprising uh, event. And at the same time, when, so, uh, when Central and Eastern Europe became independent, there was a movement for independence in republics, especially in the Baltics. Very, very brave people, small nations, extremely brave people. And they achieved their independence before the dissolution, de facto, in the, of the Soviet Union that this former dissolution of the Soviet Union happened in December 91. It was another unprecedented event. Three presidents, President Yeltsin of Russia, President uh, Shushkevich of Belarus, and President of Ukraine signed an agreement dissolving the Soviet Union. And there were no massive protests. There were no military uprisings, not Russian demonstrations defending the Soviet Union. Nobody defended them. Yeltsin was a great man. Usually the people of the West prefer Gorbachev because he was very polite, charming. Yeltsin was not so polite, <laughs> but was braver. Without him, Russia would not abandon the, the Soviet Union. Okay, so you have two parallel stories, which are to some extent interconnected. When we started in Poland, our change, there were some people from Russia or then Soviet Union, uh, future reformers who came to us to, to see how we are dealing with problems. So there was some learning. So, and socialism, as I said, was not defended by any massive demonstration in any countries, including Russia. And for most countries, it was a liberation, because it was a liberation. The Soviet system was imposed, including on the Russians. Bolsheviks, who introduced this, operated by terror and indoctrination. Then once uh, under Stalin, they got military stronger, they introduced socialist first in Mongolia <clears throat> before the Second World War and after the Second World War. Because of the outcomes, they imposed the system in all of Central Eastern Europe. And without the threat of Soviet intervention, the regime would be long abandoned. What are the proofs? Uprising in Hungary in 1956. It was put down bloodily by the Soviet troop uprising, or at least uh, attempts to reform in 1968 in former Czechoslovakia. It was put down by the intervention. And so the Soviet threat was effective. Even in Poland, when first solidarity came in 1980, it was a huge surprising event. We realized that there are certain limits which we should not separate. So we did not uh, declare independence. We did not declare privatization. We did not declare multi-party system. <laughs> and even the demands which were put forward then by solidarity movement were too much. And as a result, there was an introduction of a martial law in Poland in, uh, on the 13th December 1981. Okay, now, so this is more or less very briefly how the socialist was dissolved in the former Soviet Union, and now what happened after that? Very brief story. First political system. You, there's a standard measure, polity four. The closer you are to 10, so if you have 10 or close to 10, you are recognized as full democracy. 
meaning regular free elections, not just one, regular free. As I mentioned yesterday, full democracy can bring about very different results, depending on the distribution of views and actions in the society. <laughs> but these are democracies. So Central and Eastern Europe is democratic. By the way, Mongolia too, which may be a surprising, because there is not a long democratic tradition in Mongolia. Who is the greatest hero in Mongolia by far? Of course, if you come to Mongolia, the airport is Genghis Khan, vodka is Genghis Khan, <laughs> and most good things are named after Genghis Khan. <laughs> so you have democracy so far in the Genghis Khan country. So that's some surprises. So I don't think it's true that you have to have a long tradition to be democratic. Tradition has to start someday. <laughs> Sometimes you build the tradition. Do not wait, because if you wait, you never achieve the tradition. <laughs> okay, China, according to these measures, is non-democratic, along with Vietnam. But as I said, under the rule of the party, which is called communism, they abandoned communism in the economy. So do not be blinded by the name. I told you another anecdote. When I was the governor of Polish Central Bank, I invited my colleague from China, the governor of Chinese Central Bank, and he accepted to make a public speech on Chinese economic reforms. And he said, in China, we are building socialist market economy, socialist market economy. And then he added, very proudly, in some regions, all enterprises are already private. You know, the classical definition of socialism, <laughs> a ban on private ownership. But he was just using official language. And under official language, socialist could mean private ownership. So they're still using this language. <laughs> uh, OK, so in China, and there is a big question, of course, in China, what next? We are looking at what is going on in Hong Kong. <laughs> Now, uh, some countries moved to democracy and then reversed. And this is Belarus, under Lukashenko. This is Uzbekistan. Uh, this is Kazakhstan. There are some differences in harshness, but they are not. And uh, this is Russia. In Russia, you can see Russia somewhere. Russia was heading towards democracy under Yeltsin and towards more rule of law. For example, KGB, uh, the Russia was divided into three parts. In year, under Putin, it was year United, unification of KGB and enlargement of the competences of KGB. But Yeltsin was weak and weaker <clears throat> because perhaps he was drinking a little, a little too much vodka, he was ill. So he was much more dependent on other people in the second term. And he was looking for a successor in the late 90s. The, I think the person who could be relied on not to reverse and to protect Yeltsin and his family, and he tried three persons, and finally he has chosen Putin. And then they said Putin Russia, for the first three years, it seemed that Putin would maintain this previous system, would not abolish a reverse. But then it's, he started to reverse. First, he concentrated the power over the regions. He has eliminated the popular choice of the governors, so he centralized power. And then he started to reduce the civil rights until the point that you have elections, but you are sure who would win. So mock elections, and finally he started to shrink. He started to enlarge the political power over the economy in two ways. First, by outright nationalization. I mean, national enterprises are always transmission belt of political power to the enterprises, everywhere. And the most spectacular example was the nationalization or expropriation of Yukos, Khodorkovsky. Then he moved further. And second, he strengthened the dependence of nominally private owners on his will and KGB. So in fact, in Russia, you have something which is legally private ownership, but you may call it 
a temporary private ownership or conditional private ownership. Okay, so in Russia we can't speak of democracy since a couple of years, while there is still democracy in Ukraine. Very chaotic, but you have a lot of pluralism. So we, what we have been witnessing since a couple of months is an aggression of non-democratic Russia against democratic Ukraine. If you are interested in that, we can discuss this issue. Now, what about change in the economic institutions? One elementary measure is what is happening to the private versus uh, public sector. And you see some countries which are quasi-socialist, like Turkmenistan, Belarus, Uzbekistan, where the outright state sector still prevails. But in other countries, the majority is the private sector. <clears throat> but, including Russia, but here I have to develop what I have said before. This diagram does not show huge differences in the type of private ownership. And the simple dichotomy would be this, a private ownership of equal treatment. So uh, success or failure of respective enterprises does not depend on their political connections or connections with the repressive apparatus. And this is more or less what we've managed to build in Poland. And I think in most other Central European countries. So you enterprises do not need private enterprises to need to, to concentrate on the connections with the political powers. There's reasonable, reasonable equal treatment. The equal treatment does not necessarily mean very good treatment because we have a lot to do to improve bureaucracy. <laughs> but it's at least more or less equally bad or equally good. Uh, I can tell you that one early measure which I introduced in September, in early eight and, uh, eight and nine, well, once I became responsible for Polish economy, was to dismiss all the heads of tax offices because I wanted to break the personal connections between tax apparatus and enterprises. In Russia, and still to some extent in Ukraine, you have a different kind of private ownership, which I call politicized. Sometimes the word krone is used. But chronic capitalism in some Western economies is much less chronic than chronic capitalism under Putin. <laughs> because here, as a rule, you have to have political connections. And if you have a better political connections, you can eliminate your competitor by using prosecutors, KGB, etc. So what is the result of such a system? First, you do not invest too much uncertainty. Second, you try to transfer your capital abroad. So capital flight. And as a result of this system, Russia is economically very weak. Because low investment, uncertainty, huge dependence on exports of raw materials, which has increased. It used to be 50% of exports consisting of oil and gas. Now it's 70%. So huge, it is a backward country. Huge dependence. So if prices of gas and oil fall, Putin would be very vulnerable. If uncertainty in the private sector, a fragile financial sector, very much dependent on Western ca capital markets. Okay, so <clears throat> you have different economic systems, even if there's a majority of private ownership, because what kind of private ownership of uh, you get depends on the kind of the state you get. What else? Opening. Socialist countries were close to the West and open to each other. This opening was motivated first by political reasons, but also by economic reasons. Under socialists, you could not export very much processed goods, because under socialists, you could not be innovative. So countries relied on the exports of raw materials, if they had. In Poland, under socialists, what did we export to the West? Coal, sulfur, copper, 
a very little processed goods, some foodstuffs. Now, a huge diversification of exports. And no central planning plan, planner would ever dream the kind of goods we are exporting. Now, as you can see, there has been an openness. So the share of uh, trade, including summing up ex uh, export and imports, and including services, has increased very much. But there are differences. As I mentioned, in Russia, this opening consisted mostly in increasing the export of raw materials because of the nature of the institutional regime. In Poland, in other countries, there was a surge in exports of production and uh, in the production export of processed goods. Uh, there are some I interesting comparator countries. Look at Brazil, how close it is. Brazil is very close, which means there is little competition. And with little competition, you can't be very competitive. Look at Greece. Greece is a small country, but what a low ratio of trade to GDP, which means there must be some hidden barriers to imports in Greece. And in a small country which you don't have, where you don't have much import competition, there's a lot of inefficiency. Okay. There are some other measures, but we'll skip for a discussion, fiscal problems, etc. But the basic new observation would be this. First, democracy and capitalism go together. And this was confirmed. No capitalism, no democracy. So Central and Eastern Europe introduced both. Second, under non-democratic systems, which have introduced or introduced uh, in Russia and some other countries. You have two types of economic regimes. The first one I call quasi-socialist, like Belarus, Central Asia. So there's still a predominance of the state sector. But you have quasi-capitalistic economies like Russia, where, however, the nature of private ownership is different than, say, in Poland, as I said, or in Ukraine, okay, in Russia. <clears throat> and Kazakhstan to some extent too. The next section, and this will be a last but one, is what about economic outcomes? GDP is a very imperfect measure, but I think the best we have. <laughs> Measuring uh, uh, economic growth, especially what you should, of course, pay attention to large differences. Small differences may be misleading, so I am going to present you this. No, this is China and Russia, I skip for the discussion. Now, until the crisis of 2008, you see huge differences in the cumulative economic growth. So Poland has in increased GDP by 77%. So compare it to Ukraine, when it's still below, initial level of 89. Russia, only 12% increase. Georgia, below, but mostly because of a civil war. Then they initiated brave reforms. So huge differentiation. What happened during the crisis, there was a sharp differentiation all over Europe, including Central and Eastern Europe. Some countries managed to grow, even slowly, but managed. And this is, as you can see, Poland, among other countries. Some other countries suffered a decline, cumulative decline. Who was growing? Countries which did not allow credit boom to develop. Because if you don't have a boom, you are not threatened by the bust. So no boom, no bust. And this is one, I think, of the main reasons why in Poland we did not have a collapse of GDP. But some countries, like the Latvians, or more generally speaking, but, uh, the Baltic state plus Bulgaria, they have suffered a huge credit boom and they suffered a, a collapse of GDP in 2009, but they recovered very quickly, as distinct from, for example, from Greece. Why the Latvian, why the Baltics and uh, Bulgaria have this foul-shaped recovery? I think because they 
introduce very early on a very tough fiscal stabilization. They cut spending mostly. And they regain competitiveness. While in Greece, you have a very protected, protracted and badly structured adjustment program, which costed Greece 25% of GDP, gradual decline. Okay, so, so if you look at accumulative growth, you should skip Belarus because in this diagram, should not pay much attention because they are falsifying statistics. But other countries use, again, very large differences. And uh, you see, surprisingly, Albania, perhaps, which is a very good performer. But then, among other countries, it is Poland, the Baltics, who are in the lead. At the other extreme, you still have Ukraine, who suffered, which suffered from a bad regime plus a collapse. Russia has only 18% increase, but surprisingly, perhaps Bulgaria. So it's a huge differentiation of GDP outcomes. And whenever you have huge differentiation, you are interested in a question why. And I will come very briefly to this question, but before I present you non-economic outcomes. Economy is not everything. So life, no, this is not that. Non-economic, life expectancy, statistically speaking. Under socialism, we have a strange phenomenon in some countries, including Poland. Women tended to have a longer lives, but not men. So perhaps women were more tolerant of socialism than men. <laughs> Another explanation is that men drank much more vodka than women. <laughs> now, what has happened? After the collapse, statistically speaking, men started to have also prospects of longer life, except for Russia, where <coughs> statistical expectation is declining. And the most likely explanation is that they drink still a lot, men. Often. In Poland, you know, it's what the radical reforms have contributed to some health shifts. It is not a joke. In what ways? First, <clears throat> under socialism, you could drink on the job because state managers did not care very much. And drinking on the job was dr regarded as a human right. It's not only in Poland, in France, the train drivers think they should, could drink on the job, they are ready to strike. But when you drink in dangerous jobs, you may have fall a victim to an accident. Once we privatized enterprises, the exploiters, meaning private owners, did not allow drinking on the job. So you have less accidents. <laughs> Second, uh, economic reform includes a revolution in relative prices. And relative prices of more healthy food became lower. Vegetables, uh, tropical fruits. You know, under socialists, we got, we got oranges only for Christmas and mostly from Cuba. <laughs> now they are everywhere, including from Ether, I think. And uh, fish became cheaper than pork in some kinds of, so you have a huge changes in a diet because of uh, economic, uh, economic reforms. So there are some, also pollution has decreased. Why? Because energy started to be more expensive. So you use less energy, you pollute less. Okay, so that also changes in non-economic indicators. Let me mention finally, what would be the main explanations for the variation in economic growth? There's a huge literature on that, so there's no need to speculate. My reading of this literature is the following ones. First, the earlier you start with market reforms and then the more accumulate, more changes you accumulate, the better for economic growth, because you strengthen your agent for growth. And in Poland, we started quite early, and we have not suffered so far any major reverses. By the way, one thing is to introduce reforms. Another thing is to maintain them. Some reforms tend to be reversed. 
So the constant vigilance in the civil society of the freedom fighters is needed. There are many instances of reverse reforms. We see what is going to happen in Sweden. So the more reforms, the better. Second, it's good to, ev to avoid domestic shocks produced by policies. Because then, if you have a boom, you tend to suffer a bust. And the most important tool is monetary policy. I can tell you as a former central banker, I never, and I never tried to emulate Mr. Greenspan. So I was more restrictive. I thought monetary policy has to be restrictive, especially if you want to lower inflation, but even afterwards. And I think this has contributed to the fact that we have avoided the credit boom, plus some extra measures. So no shocks or less shocks, more economic growth, and then finally I am finishing. Fiscal stance. Uh, one explanation why Hungary has such a disappointing performance on growth is that the fiscal stance of Hungary has been chronically ill, even worse than in Poland. In Poland, we did not have a very good fiscal stance. It was very difficult, but not as bad as in Hungary. So this would be some of the lessons uh, of uh, regarding this huge variation in economic growth. But finally, the most important lesson is that the policies regarding pol economic policies in democracy depend, as I said yesterday, on the distribution of forces. Status forces are present everywhere, in every country, in the US, in Israel, in Poland. So the only break on the influence is to either crisis, stagnation, or the counterweight which has to be created by, the say, free market forces, or in the European language, liberal forces, in a given society. There is no good substitute for that. Thank you very much. Yes, um, two questions, I'll start with the short one. Um, in uh, Israel and I think also in the United States, the, go the main goal of the monetary authority is to uh, achieve price stability and lowering unemployment. Uh, when you're saying that uh, in Poland, uh, you cannot not uh, try to increase the price supply and your, uh, and your uh, objective was uh, stable prices and lowering inflation, does it mean that the bank had no say, and that the monetary authority had no say regarding unemployment? It did not try to lower unemployment at all? We had a huge say through low inflation. You know, there are two kinds of mandates. The American mandate, which is bad, and the European man mandate, which is better. <laughs> the American mandate says that equally, the central bank, Fed, has to care about inflation, low inflation, and unemployment. But then, it is uh, susceptible to pressures to, in to give more monetary stimulus in this regard of inflation uh, of consumer price inflation or asset price inflation. So it's a, it has been very heavily criticized in the US by many economists, this double mandate. In Europe, the mandate has been mostly modeled on Bundesbank. The model bank for the world is Bundesbank. And we largely adopted the Bundesbank model, including the mandate, which is low inflation, and uh, we rely on empirical evidence that the central bank should care about low inflation and longer term growth, not short term growth. And you care, caring by low about low inflation, we contribute the most what the central bank can contribute to the longer term growth. There was a second consideration which was not present in most central banks' uh, thinking was what about asset prices? And here we have a huge discussion nowadays. <laughs> In our mandate, it was not a, also asset prices. But we came to the conclusion when I was the governor that housing credit denominated in foreign currency is growing by 30% a year. It is dangerous. <laughs> and uh, pretty restrictive monetary policy by itself was not enough. This is what introduced extra measures. We, this was Poland's anti-subprime policy. <laughs> 
in the US with subprime. So stimulating credit given to not credit worse uh, uh, persons. We introduce measures which make it more expensive to borrow. And since we were independent, we, we did it. There were criticism, but uh, an independent central bank, as long as it is independent, is going to be criticized. If it is not criticized by some politicians, there's something wrong with its policies. So I can tell you as a former central banker, and I have three attacks <laughs> on the central bank independence during my ten six year tenure. And fortunately, we have repulsed all these attacks. And central banks, in fact, independence was stronger. That was the first question. Yeah? Okay. Yeah. 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 And, but I also heard that the uh, Prime Minister said it's not going to happen, but the, uh, the Finance Minister said it is going to happen. Is it going to happen in your opinion? And why should it or should it? It's a huge surprise to me, this news. Poland would not adopt Euro in the foreseeable future. First, because we would have to change uh, our constitution. And for that, we have need two-thirds majority. There is no such a majority in the foreseeable future. <coughs> Second, and related, you would have to convince the majority of the population it's impossible because the uh, Polish lot is quite stable, so people trust it, and they watch every day these horror stories about what's going on in the Eurozone, so why should they opt for Euro? It's politically impossible. Third, I don't regard it as a drama for Poland not to adopt Euro quite quickly, because what Poland needs it's more reforms. We've been reasonably successful so far, but this does not mean that the future success is assured. It's not assured. First, uh, given aging, we have to introduce extra measures to e increase the employment ratio among younger people and older people. Second, our ratio of private investment is too low some 15 percent and you cannot substitute private investment by public investment if you could socialists could be equally good as capitalists it can't public investment tends to be politicized everywhere and third we've been very successful with increasing overall productivity as measured by total factor productivity which captures innovations, technology transfer, structural change. But during recent years, the rate of growth of overall efficiency has declined. And we still don't know exactly why. Probably you don't have enough competition in some sectors. Our public universities are hopelessly inefficient. And they do not compete and do not have much to offer to business. So we need extra. So I am trying to mobilize public opinion in Poland, not for early entry into Euro, which is impossible politically, but for to reforms. This is much more important. Because if you look at the Eurozone, you see sharp differentiation. There has been some healthy countries like Germany, say Austria, and some uh, trouble problem countries like Greece or Spain or Ireland. So a huge differentiation. Why? Because of the differences in national policies. So one has to focus on national policies, including Poland. Please. You said then briefly about that the Russia might go bankrupt. But what, how, it, how it will affect Russia and the world currently? Politically, we can't predict it from Russia. But. No, you have sometimes situations when you have to, you don't have safe options. So you have to choose what you consider to be less risk op option from your from point of view of your purpose. I give you one example. When I was uh, entrusted with the job of uh, stabilizing and reforming Poland's economy, I have a realization that basically we have two options a gradual change or partial change, which I consider to be hopeless, hopeless. And a radical change, which I consider to be very risky. Very risky option is always better than hopeless option. 
Okay? So this is the type of a situation. Now regarding what Putin has been doing so far. He started a de facto aggression against independent Ukraine. <clears throat> and they changed the choices between no sanctions, soft sanctions, or strong sanctions. <laughs> you have no guarantee of success if you use strong sanctions. But you should assume that weak sanctions are hopeless. Because weak sanctions encourage further aggression. So choose between options which are available. Many Europeans tend to disregard this. Either they have wrong perceptions or they want to mask their doing business with Putin. Like many Germans. And some of them behave in shameless way, I must say, like Schroeder, former chancellor who is serving still on the board of Gazprom. Well, there was a head of Siemens, the huge industrial in Germany, who went just after Russia's aggression against Ukraine, he, head of Siemens, went to Putin, and he waited for two hours to be admitted. And he said then, no, we care about, we are attached to, <laughs> to Russia with our business deals. So this is, I may uh, say, what is happening in Ukraine has a geopolitical significance. And this is important, should be important, especially for the United States. China is watching what is the West reaction to Putin. And China, as you know, is expanding and potentially aggressive power. And Japan is watching. And the other countries is watching. So if there are weak sanctions, there would be an arms race. In the place, uh, if I had to be, you know, I was responsible for Japan, I would before armament in Japan. Americans gave security guarantees to some countries in South Asia. What is the value of these guarantees so far regarding what Putin is allowed to do in Ukraine? And you know, Ukraine got a guarantee. Ukraine in 1994 gave up nuclear arms in exchange for security guarantee from Russia, France, Britain, and United States. So this is the area of geopolitical significance. What is going on? Yes, please. I will bring uh, two different points, two, two points that, uh, that you, you discussed, and we make from that one question. Uh, the first one is that, uh, that capitalism and democracy do not go together, and uh, you, you, you stated in particular in one related one, you cannot have a, no, socialism and democracy do not go together. Socialism? Yes. This is more different. Okay. And, this, and the second uh, issue is that, uh, that when there's no restrictions, for, uh, you, it can lead to greater disasters than what democracy can, can, can do, because you somehow are restricted on, on uh, democracy. So, and the example that uh, comes to my mind is the uh, example of Chile, and uh, even though it was a very bloody uh, detector, uh, no, having no restrictions uh, was uh, allowed to Pinochet you know, to implement reform very quickly without having to pers uh, persuade any Congress or passing a law. So the, the point is that those no restrictions when falling on the, on the right uh, direction you may get a result that democracy cannot uh, have. Is, is that uh, correct? When you generalize, you should look at the whole population of cases, not just of one case. Yes. And then if you look at the whole population of non-constrained regimes, then you see that the worst cases are much worse than non the worst cases under democracies. Stalin, Mao, Khmer Rouge, and this is enough, I think, to reject yeah. this. There are some people who dream to have a good king. Yeah. They, may, they may land with Mobutu. <laughs> so one has to work within democracy, meaning uh, civil rights, because it's a complex. And again, be stronger, <laughs> influencing public opinion. Uh, yeah, you mentioned uh, Russia and China. And uh, in a way, their starting point was very similar. I'm not special in any of the countries. But then China seemed to have negotiated like, uh, a much better way. 
economic growth than Russia. So why didn't Russia do mm. what China did? That's a very important, uh, very important questions. question. Now, first of all, <clears throat> there were so far three paths or three trajectories regarding socialist countries. The first is China, which in the late 70s started the policy uh, changing, fundamentally changing the economic regime under Deng Xiaoping. The second path is what has happened in Central and Eastern Europe and then Soviet Union, call it European way. And the third are the remaining socialist countries, North Korea, Cuba, yes, they are remnants. Now, why China has adopted this way, it's a big story. <laughs> and involves, again, personality, like Deng Xiaoping. It will be without him, probably, there was not, would be not such a change or delayed change. And it was not easy even for him to persist. He faced strong opposition. And in Chinese history, since late 70s, you have ups and downs. For example, last 10 years, there was a stall in economic reform. They were not moving forward, and they, they need to do. And we don't know still what the new ruler is going to do. I tried to tell a short, short the story of the Soviet Union, which involves a lot of chance factors. Uh, and personality factors, too. Now, many people uh, are rightly surprised by huge differences in Chinese economic performance compared to the Russia's economic performance so far. And this is a very good question. So what is my view of the main differences? First, the initial conditions in China were much better for economic growth than the initial conditions in Russia. And this was an objective factor. When China started in economic change, it was a backward country dominated by agriculture. And agriculture was organized in a nonsensical Maoist communes. Compulsory. These were not kibbutz. Kibbutz are voluntary. <laughs> Maoist communes were compulsory. <laughs> and based on, there were no lack of, there were no incentives. So everybody, regardless of her or his work, was getting the same. So you can imagine there was no efficiency. And the first step, which was huge, was dissolve these communes and to give the farmers quasi-private rights. It was not full right, but long last least. Chinese agriculture was very simple at that time, so it was very easy giving power farmers incentives to reform agriculture. So they set in motion a huge process of change. And remember, agriculture employed some, I don't know, 60% of the population. So we had a huge first impetus. Now, this could not be repeated in Russia. Russia was more, but badly developed. So it much more, was much more industrialized. Agriculture had a smaller share and was heavily mechanized. It was much more difficult to be parceled and was hugely inefficient. So they could not use this boost. This is the first very important factor. The second, Chinese uh, had many, there are some 60 million overseas Chinese, most of them wealthy. Taiwan, Hong Kong, Sin Singapore, Thailand, etc. And they tapped the Chinese capital. There was not such a Russian capital. <laughs> Very few wealthy Russians <laughs> outside Russia. Uh, third, and this regards policies, I think, in, uh, in, 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 there was I think, more opening in China than in Russia, including opening to foreign direct investment. So I would say that initial conditions tend to explain a good part of the initial performance, and then you have personalities factors, political factors. But even under best policies, Russia could not have repeated Chinese economic performance given the huge differences in the initial conditions. Yes? Um, before uh, what he asked, you mentioned that you, uh, your policy is to maintain a low, um, low inflation rate. And 
low unemployment rate, which doesn't go together. Low inflation and what? And, and low unemployment rate. Well, it goes together mm. in the longer run. But it means, how can it go together by what we studied? With in, it's in negative co correlation. Once then the, once then you're probably referring to what they are being still taught at universities, Phillips curve. Yeah. Forgot Phillips curve. <laughs> 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 because this is a wrong information. And one has to watch at the longer term differences in unemployment, not just short term possible trade offs. You should care more about longer term. This has been a huge empirical wor work done among other institutions by OECD, job starters, about the differences in the longer term unemployment across developed countries. And there have been huge differences. For example, in France, in Italy, and until recently in Germany, the long term unemployment tended to be higher than until recently, say, in Britain and the US. And they tried to investigate what were the reasons behind this. What are, what are the main findings? Not monetary reasons in monetary policy, not so much in fiscal policy, but in some regulations. First, the degree of job protection. If it's excessive, very high, then it's too risky to employ. So there's less employment of people with permanent contracts, and in some countries they introduce these flexible contracts, and in this way they uh, introduce a dual labor market, two categories of people, which is not just, if I may use this word, and under shocks, who is fired first? Younger people. So it's much better to reduce, overall reduce, this excessive job protection. This was first fine. The second, uh, taxes. Turn out that higher taxes tend to reduce the demand, even though one could think that there should be tax incidents, that taxes should be shifted, but turns out they are not fully shifted. So excessive taxes. Uh, um, ex uh, if you have excessive minimum wage, which was, I understand, discussed, then people with low skills and younger tend to be priced out of the job market. So these are regulatory or structural factors which, are contrib which uh, contribute to longer term unemployment. There were some theoretical findings in economic literature. For example, Akerlof got the Nobel Prize for his theory that he has, in my mind, invented a new market failure, which is not genuine. <laughs> but you may got a Nobel Prize for inventing market failures. Yeah, yeah, this is a fashion. Now, he said, I think Stiglitz do, that free markets tend to set wages above uh, market clearing levels, which produces some unemployment. There are some explanations. Why this theory is false, even though it's very fashionable? Because this theory cannot explain huge differences in unemployment. And to explain huge differences in unemployment, you have to look at policies, the state actions, and not free market actions. So this is just one example of this fashion to invent market failures. And then to invoke the state to correct markets. <laughs> yes, please. Yeah, so just to add to your point, there's a difference between causality and, and the correlation. So in the se that sense, the Phillips curve doesn't tell us a lot. So that's why it's not an efficient tool in economics to understand something. But my question is, I, as I understand, the rapid economic change depends a lot of the required the social acceptance, openness to change. Since so the people need to understand that the old system is broken. And that's I was wondering how did Poland make that switch of, of mentality, of understanding that the old system is broken, that the perestroika in Russia was the one that caused people to realize that, okay, something is wrong, or was it parallel ideas inside of all, like scholars or public figures? Well, first, you never get social acceptance, meaning acceptance of the whole society. It's impossible. So you, it's enough to get enough support, but never 100%. It's absolutely impossible. Second, 
in some, you cannot rely on, on persuasion. You can't persuade everybody, especially groups who defend their interests. They are not susceptible to persuasion. So, in a democratic way, I am not speaking about dictatorship, in a democratic way, you should use certain strategies. <clears throat> and I tell you what strategies we have used in Poland. <laughs> First, as I already mentioned, once you have liberation, you know, Poland became free, but there was also economic crisis. There was a special atmosphere, meaning that more people were ready, more ready than normal to accept difficult changes, normally difficult changes. What is the best use of this special time? To move forward very quickly. But in order to be able to move very quickly in correct direction, you have to be prepared. And this is a chance factor. Normally, under socialism, we are not taught about market reforms, <laughs> but I had the hope that starting in the late 70s, I was interested. Some people watch birds, some other people collect stamps, and I collected reforms. <laughs> and I even created an informal group of 10 younger people to work on that as a hobby. And we worked for 10 years without ever dreaming that this would be useful. So we, this was a useless hobby, which turned out to be useful. <laughs> so as I said yesterday, work just in case. Do not assume certainty. Assume just a chance and be prepared to use this chance. So moving quickly uh, during this extraordinary policy is very, very important. Then persist. Do not be, be ready for resistance. Do not be naive. Interest groups do not give up. So be, persist. Uh, and again, for example, when I was tackling some tax privileges, which were given to enterprises employing uh, disabled people. In fact, they, under the guise of these tax preferences, they employ healthy people, or at least disabled. Okay, I knew that they are going to mobilize the resistance that they are going to bring disabled people in the wheelchairs in front of the Minister of Finance, and they did. I was not surprised, <laughs> and we did it. When I knew that the medical profession wants to have increases in spending, <clears throat> then I attacked first, not physical, but we prepared a book on the waste, the waste in the health service and they were in the corner. But for that, you have to be quick and to be prepared. And you, more or less, would be your opponent and be proactive. Then conclude alliances. You do not have to agree 100% with abroad, but on some issues you can agree. So make alliances. When uh, we are trying to close inefficient mines in Poland, of course, trade unions were against this. But I found out that the communities where, which had these mines were not very enthusiastic of them because the mines did not pay taxes. So I included an agreement with them, an informal agreement <laughs> against the market. And look for these sort of thematic issues, alliances, and of course, very good communication team. Uh, and using simple language. Very simple. You, most important issues in economics can be explained very simply. And if you can't explain, they are not important. Very simple. Now, Russia. You know, in Poland, the period of extraordinary politics was longer than in Russia. So they have less time. I was, uh, I had friends among Russian reformers. Uh, and I knew that they, they had difficult, more difficult. They faced more resistance. In Poland, we have a very reformist parliament who supported reforms. In Russia, they faced the opposition from the parliament, which was elected still under Gorbachev times. So they are more cons I think that their direction more or less was correct, but they have less opportunity. And uh, the Russian reformers was, were, were blamed for the consequences of Gorbachev policies. I mentioned to you 
oligarchs. The oligarchs, the early oligarchs appeared because of Gorbachev, but this was a blame on Gaidar and his team. But they moved in the correct way. Yes. Uh, I have a kind of uh, follow-up question. Uh, so you mentioned that in '89, Poland was actually the first country that retained a non-communist uh, government. So as a member of this government, I'm interested to hear your, uh, in your opinion, what was the main reason of Poland being the first, the first country? Okay, I think first of solidarity movement ten years ago. It appeared surprisingly in the summer, August of 1980. It was a surprising agreement between the communist authorities and uh, the new leader, Lech Wałęsa. And this is a personality factor. He turned an uh, electrician. You know, electricians are usually very clever. More, they you know have to be clever <laughs> dealing with <laughs> having the risk of electrical shocks. <laughs> okay. Uh, and surprisingly, the communist authorities in Poland signed an agreement which allowed the existence of free trade union, something anathema to the communist dogma. <laughs> and then this movement uh, uh, increased to have 10 million people. It was suppressed in December 81, but the memory of it remained and also informal structure. Poland's martial law was not very repressive, fortunately. So it was not very risky to work underground. Many people write underground, many newspapers, etc. almost everybody. <laughs> but still, it was not certain how would it end. And I said, uh, because communist authorities were afraid of radical reforms, or this went beyond their imagination, they wanted to co-opt opposition. They didn't want to give them power, but to, to shift responsibility. And they started what was called talks at the round table in the late 88, and it continued. And the result was very different from the initial intentions, <laughs> as it happens. The authorities agreed to have free elections into the Polish lower chamber and to completely free elections to the newly created Senate and they agreed to legalize solidarity, which emerged of this as a main political force. And there were elections on the 4th of June. Uh, the communists expected to win them, while solidarity was not certain. As a result, there was a crashing, overwhelming victory of solidarity side. In this half free, it is completely free elections to the Senate, all but one, Seats were won by solidarity, out of 199. <laughs> you know, even in the military districts, it turned out that people voted for solidarity. <laughs> so this was a breakthrough. And after the breakthrough, there was a question who would assume power. Then communists started. And there was a prime minister who uh, tried to have a government, but he failed. Solidarity leadership was not enthusiastic because they knew there was an economic catastrophe. They had no economic program. They rather wanted to demand from the authorities to give them something, better life, without having a blueprint for reforms. But finally, they came to the conclusion they have to assume responsibility. And there was a sort of the deal, political deal. Solidarity agreed to have a president who was General Jaruzelski, he was a former dictator. <laughs> he introduced the martial law, he was a general. While Solidarity assumed to have his prime minister, his prime minister, it's, which was a former advisor to Lech Wałęsa, his name was Tadeusz Mazowiecki, he started, he was elected by the parliament in the late September, and he started to complete the government. It was very easy for him to find a minister for culture, this is an attractive job. It was not very difficult for him to fight a minister for foreign affairs, also pretty attractive. It turned very difficult to find for him somebody in charge of the economy. <laughs> Some professors refused. And then they turned to me. I refused because I was to leave to Britain to have lectures. 
They asked me to reconsider. My wife was against. You can imagine, it's very risky, so far, but I accepted. If I were the professor, I would reject it. But I was not then a professor. <laughs> okay, so it started. And I can tell you why I accept first, because I, by chance I did some homework, I mentioned to you. Second, there was a team. Third, I said that I am ready to accept the job only if I launch a radical stabilization reform. So I was not interested in the job itself. Fourth, I was also a coordinator of the overall economic policy, and I have a say in picking up ministers, because you had a team. Yes. You mentioned yesterday the reforms that you were trying to do in the labor market, and today you mentioned the minimum wage. So I'm trying to figure out which reform did you try and why did it fail? This is the one, because, uh, uh, no, no, no. Uh, we did not manage to reform sufficiently DP universities. You know, there are two kinds of organization after socialism. The first one is enterprises. And there is one simple solution, privatization. There are no equally effective solutions. You have to privatize. There may be some exceptions. But the burden of the proof is. But you cannot privatize the courts. And you shouldn't. <laughs> you cannot privatize uh, prosecutors. And uh, to restructure this organization is more difficult than to just to privatize enterprises. With universities, we should have privatized them, I think. But we did not have time, and there was too much resistance. They are still public. But what we did, we, uh, we opened the possibilities for creation of private universities, and there was a search in private universities, not always of high quality, but not all public universities are for high quality. So we have, to some extent, a competition. But it is not a very fair competition, because only private universities get money for students who study full time, not the private. This is a discrimination of uh, private universities, which should be abolished. But for that, it has to be much more mobilization. So then my main point is, it's more difficult to reform organization outside the enterprise sector. Hospitals. Some of the, uh, how to prevent that hospitals would make losses, as it is case in Poland. How to combine medical efficiency with economic efficiency. It can be done, but it's more tricky than transforming uh, simple enterprises. So where we are lagging are not in the enterprise sector. We are lagging outside the enterprise sector. But you have much more, say, public influence. And also many myths. Many people think in a socialist way that hospitals have to be public or universities have to be public. This is a myth. But myths have strong life. Yes? yes. You mentioned before that one of the reasons for the weakness of the Russia was that she very influenced by the Western market and by changes uh, from outside, she was very, uh, unstable. Under Under Gorbachev, yes. So, uh, I think today, in today's situation, every country is actually open to, uh, to the markets. How can you uh, even the, the country to changes from outside and still enjoy the open market? You mean when the sanctions can be combined with open markets? This how is your question. How can you uh, enjoy the open market uh, yes. on export and import yes. and still uh, prevent uh, catastrophic uh, um, input from outside? Like, uh, if uh, America crashes, how can you union your country but still enjoy the open market? Uh, you mean what are the dangers related to open markets, usually called globalization? How can you union your country? You can't. But you have to compare the risks, again. And isolation is much more costly. We know it from lots of experience. And especially for small countries, it's an economic suicide. So you have to uh, choose something which is hopeless, and between something which is hopeless and something which is risky. <laughs> and risk is always better than hopeless. Mm -hmm. 
There were periods of isolation in between the wars. It was very bad, especially for poor countries. There was a previous globalization in the second half of the 19th century until the First World War. There was a period of growth. Then after, after the Second World War, we have another period of globalization. Yes? Do you see any difference between uh, the way economic reforms are being established in different countries, meaning if reforms are being established quickly, will it affect the growth in that country more rapidly or less? Depends, of course, on the initial situation. In the case of Poland and other countries of socialism, it was the quicker, the better, as long as you were prepared. But in some other countries, when the scope of necessary reforms is modest, you may sometimes try to persuade more people. And sometimes you succeed. So it depends. I am not saying you can persuade anybody, everybody. But it matters of other situations which differ across countries. So I am not proposing a general recipe because not, not every country had such a catastrophic situation combined with economic and political freedom as in Poland. I would tend, if it is possible, to rather move fast than slow because in most cases you cannot gain much by a persuasion. But in some, perhaps, yes. Yes? yes. You talked before about private privatizing hospitals, privatizing uh, healthcare. This is like, this is one of those fields when you have a huge information gap between the cuts. The information cuts asymmetry, and, yes. Yes, so I, I'm, I'm trying to imagine a world, well, I guess the US sort of works that way, but in, a, in, in this idea, how would it work? How would you make, how can they be profitable and still see that people get good healthcare? Because it's, it's not their incentive really to get people to live longer just to have more and more health problems. That's how they make First it. First of all, you shouldn't uh, presume that it's an uh, unavoidable conflict between financial efficiency and medical efficiency. i give you an example. In Poland, local authorities tend to build the new hospitals because they are not paying the costs. And they have just such an ambition and they hire new surgeons. Now, in the surgeon case, skills and practice matters, and talent matters. But if you build new hospitals, you hire new surgeons. And more experienced surgeons are underutilized. You have more death because of that. Because you, the best surgeons are not working full time, inexperienced surgeons are working on you. So there's, there's, there, there, there may be a conflict between lack of economic efficiency and also uh, Lack of economic efficiency may go in hand in hand with low medical efficiency. But this is just about, so do not assume that it's always profit motive, it's also at the cost of somebody. But I agree with that in uh, more difficult cases when information asymmetry is pretty large, then I get, uh, to my understanding, there are some requirements or even voluntary initiative of the hospitals to display what is the success or failure ratio in the success in various kinds of treatments. And you may emulate having private ownership, some institutional arrangements. For example, in the financial markets, many people rely on rating agencies. <laughs> rating agencies are very imperfect, but much better than governments. It was rating agencies who predict quicker the financial crisis than IMF. <laughs> so why not have a sort of rating agency, rating hospitals? You have rating agencies regarding universities. So these are institutional helps for the consumers who would have to choose among various uh, alternative uh, offers, proposals. You have private prisons in the United States. <laughs> One last question and uh, yeah. Yeah, about uh, if we see democracy as a political competition, and on the other hand we see that uh, things on the we should look at the long term instead of the short term as what was discussed before the previous 
curve. Um, it, what would be the optimal cadencia, the optimal term for political, uh, uh, for, for a government? Mm -hmm. That's a very good question. First of all, I think this is the most useful operational definition of democracy. It is political competition as expressed in the regular elections and then you have to look at the civil rights which determine how much the political competition you get. Forget about foggy definitions, rule of the people, something of the sort. This is completely useless. <laughs> Worse than useless, counterproductive first. Second, there is a problem in all modern democracies for uh, politicians staying in office forever, from the, I mean the US, elsewhere, professionalization of political life, which I think is bad. Because these politicians lose contact with their real life and they are very dependent on uh, uh, political bosses in countries with the party's proportional representation. And this is why I am a very strong proponent on mandatory term limits. I am proposing that this, I know this, it's very difficult to do, in, to in, introduce in the United States. In some places they succeed, in some places they are not. But I think it would be a very useful reform, which would serve to have also more competition, because there are huge in, uh, incumbency benefits, which limits the competition. So, so I don't think it's against freedom, it's for competition. I think this is the most important one of the most important political reforms in democracies. Oh, you can give up your lunch. I would appreciate that as a token of recognition. <laughs> if you have short term limits, you encourage competition, but you also uh, shorten the horizon to which the politicians look. Because one of the problems, uh, I think, uh, in Israel and the other democracies is that the politician always looks to the next election. So his horizon is two or four years, so he's not going to do some radical uh, reformation like you did, because in 10 years from now, if someone else is going to reap the benefit, so he's just not going to Give do them it. six years. But <laughs> <Not> limit. <laughs> thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you.